Our, our, we're going to jump into the technical sessions now. So our first speaker for uh, faculty speaker for today is uh, Dr. Ryan uh, Sokol from the Department of Mechanical Engineering and the official Department of Bioengineering. Hi, everyone. So uh, I think this is going to be my last talk as an assistant professor, as I'll be uh, officially associate in a month. Yay. Um, but, um, you know. <laughs> But um, this is a fun one. So I'm gonna be talking a little bit about our work playing Nintendo with a 3D printed soft robotic hand. And so I think most of what you're gonna be seeing today is probably gonna be related to what I would refer to as, as traditional robotics. And these typically revolve around rigid bodied systems that are actuated and controlled using electronic means typically. But recently there's been the emergence of kind of this new class of robots. And these are referred to as soft robots. And the concept here is basically that we're, instead of using rigid body systems, we're using compliant materials. And often these are actuated using fluidic means. And there are some inherent benefits in terms of adaptability and geometry, and also safety for human robot interactions. And so over the last decade, we've seen kind of a number of, a decade or so, a number of developments related to this types, these types of technologies. And so it started out with kind of some, some cute, fun demonstrations like this camouflage robot here. And then we have this example, which is someone who suffers from ALS and has trouble using her hands. And so they developed a soft robotic glove that can help her to grasp objects without being concerned that it might hurt her hands or, or apply too much force. And then this is another example of a soft, I should have probably given a warning. This is a, a pig heart, um, so don't look if, uh, that kind of thing, uh, yeah. But uh, essentially this is a, a pig heart and basically it's an ailing heart. It's not able to pump itself correctly. And so this is a soft robotic heart sleeve that pumps it in a way that's biomimetic. And I would say actually the last year has been really exciting in terms of some of the more medical applications of, of soft robotics. And so this is an example on the top of a laser uh, oral surgery device that's using soft robotic actuation so that it's uh, MRI compatible. And then on the bottom, we actually have a, a soft robotic steerable catheter for neurosurgery. And so one of the things that you might have seen in a lot of these examples, and, and some of them try to hide this, um, is that you'll see all of these uh, control inputs that need to be used to be able to uh, actuate. Every single soft actuator needs a, a corresponding fluidic control input. So the more actuators you have, if you have, let's say, a hand with five fingers, you're gonna need five different inputs to control each one of those fingers, typically. And so one of the ways in which researchers have gotten around this issue is to actually embed what is referred to as a fluidic circuit. So just like you have an integrated electronic circuit, you can have fluidic analogs to these types of systems. And so what they did here in the study, uh, which is one of my, my favorite papers actually, is they embedded this directly inside of the robot. Uh, and while it, you know, the actual behavior is, is just the arms going up and down, this was actually a really important step in this area of integrating fluidic circuits into soft robots to control them. And so this ended up leading to two additional challenges, and I'm kind of combining them as just one big challenge. But one, how do you fabricate these types of fluidic circuits? And then after you've built them, how do you integrate them with a soft robot? And so this is something that, that is quite difficult. And so in this particular paper, I'm going to show the strategy that they employed. And the way this works is that first you go into a microfabrication clean room and you're using what's called multi-layer soft lithography. So I'm not gonna go through what this entails, but I'll tell you why I personally did not like doing it when I was a PhD student. Uh, it is time, labor, and cost intense. I didn't have to worry too much about the cost. My, my advisor would worry about that, but I didn't like having to charge it. Uh, even to start doing this, you need technical training and access to a microfabrication clean room. Also, if you have many different layers like this particular one does, you need to actually like align them by eye under a microscope, which is highly dependent on your own skill. And from a design perspective, pretty much every layer has to be these kind of rectangular monoliths. And so as a result, geometrically, you're limited as well. So that's just the first step to make your, your fluidic circuit. Once they did that, they had to actually CNC machine these particular molds, and then they're putting these in by hand. And then they're actually doing a double silicone uh, mixture casting process where they're, they have two different uh, types of silicone depending on uh, basically how soft and, and stiff they are. And then once they do that, they, they do the decasting, they cure it, um, and then they actually go through and they are 3D printing a sacrificial material. So that orange material that you're seeing that looks really cool under fluorescent light, 
that actually isn't meant to be there. It's just there while the material cures. And then once it's done, they go through a five-day process of heating this and having it evaporate from the channels. All right, so I'm sure that you can imagine that this is a, a very manufacturing intensive approach. And so when I saw this, uh, I love the concept, but I, I personally, I hate this manufacturing strategy in terms of I would personally never wanna have to do it. I've done things like this in the past. I would never want my students to do it. Uh, not even as like a punishment, just kidding. We don't ever do that in my lab. And so uh, what I wanted to do was see if we could use additive manufacturing or 3D printing to be able to print entire soft robots with all of the integrated fluidic circuitry in a single step. And so there are a couple of potential options for this. This is my, my lab's logo, and it's meant to represent the three primary types of 3D printing technologies that would be relevant to these types of scales. So there are light-based 3D printing technologies, there are extrusion-based, and there are inkjet-based. And I think for most people, when they hear the term 3D printing, they're usually thinking about something like this one in the middle. And indeed, this is a technology that my lab uh, uses and, and exploits for certain applications. Overall, compared to the ones that we're talking about, the material selection for this type of printing is the best. You can use pretty much anything that you can extrude out of a nozzle, you can print with it using this type of approach. In terms of the benefits, that's pretty much it. The print speed is the worst by far of anything that we ever use. And then also the geometric versatility is quite terrible, basically because the nozzle head has to be directly in the point to deposit the material, you're really limited in terms of the types of structures that you can manufacture. And so as a result, for this particular project, we decided to use a technology called polyjet 3D printing. And this is a lot similar to using a color printer, but instead of just printing one page, we're printing page on top of page on top of page. And another part that's special is just like how with a color printer, you can print red next to green, next to blue, et cetera. In this, you can print stiff materials next to soft materials, next to what are called sacrificial support materials that can be dissolved in water after the printing process. And so these are the students uh, from my group who, who worked on this project. And so I'll just highlight them here because they're not here today. And so the idea was basically that we, we design a bunch of different components. So we have fluidic diodes, we have fluidic transistors, we have fluidic resistors, which are basically just channels. Uh, we have capacitors, which are our actuators. We have connectors and we also have body features. And what you do is inside of your computer aided design software, you can put all these together to build your circuit, to build your complete robot. And then once you have that, you send it over to your 3D printer, and then it's gonna print it layer by layer to build this three-dimensional system. And again, as I mentioned, you can print it using compliant materials, rigid materials, and then that sacrificial support material that holds it up during the printing process. And so one of the things that you'll see here is there's kind of this, this sophisticated circuit underneath. This is a fluidic oscillator circuit, and it relies on two particular components. And so there's a fluidic diode and a fluidic transistor. So I'm just briefly gonna explain how both of those work. So this is the fluidic diode. This is really just a, a one-way check valve. And so we designed it with a rigid casing. We have this free floating disc that has a, a, an O-ring with that compliant material on top so that when you apply forward flow, it's able to come down and we have these, these spaces. So it's able to move freely through the component. But when you reverse the flow polarity, it brings those O-rings right up to that top surface in order to block fluid from going in that reverse direction. So just a one-way flow valve for this. Uh, and then one of the things that we thought was interesting is that if you look at the results, you'll see that for the reverse flow, that red area, the stronger, the more pressure that you put in the, in the backwards direction, it actually kind of pushes that O-ring with a stronger force to prevent the fluid uh, from passing through. And it performs better at higher reverse pressures, which uh, we felt was kind of uh, interesting, but, but actually helpful for what we were trying to do. And then this is the other component. This is a, what we're referring to as a normally closed fluidic transistor. And so fluidic transistor or transistor in fluidic circuitry is used a little bit loosely. This is really more of a triode or if you were to you know, bias it in the triode region. And so we have three different parts here. We have the source, the drain, and the gate. So we have a rigid casing. We have this, again, it's kind of like the free floating disc we had before, but it has this micro post in the center. We still have that O-ring on the bottom. We then have these two compliant diaphragms that are connected by an intervening piston. And so initially when you apply a source pressure, it brings that floating component down to block fluid flow through the, through the element. And so nothing's going to the drain. But what you can do is you can apply a force to the gate, specifically a pressure there. 
And what this does is it kind of pushes it up enough so it's able to hit that micropose so, so fluid can now get through it. But if you use too much pressure, you can actually get it to reclose. And so you kind of have this closed, open, and then reclosing functionality. And you can tune that reclosing functionality based on some micropose that we array around that top surface. So if you basically don't have any, you can see here, it's kind of these very sharps, flow comes up, flow drops off and you're done. But if you increase it quite a bit, you can get it to where basically it opens and it should really stay open in the operating region, depending on how you des you've designed it. So we used an Object 500 Connex 3 printer from Stratasys, which is a type of polyjet printer to do this. This is located in Terrapin Works, uh, actually right behind me. Uh, for this particular uh, turtle that I'm showing, this was an eight hour print process. But again, you, you don't have to do anything during this time, right? So we send it to them, they print it, they just tell us, hey, pick it up, that kind of thing. When it comes off, it does have the support material. So there are some processes we have to do to remove it. Uh, that takes about 60 minutes of labor for this particular one. But within 24 hours from pressing start print, you have a working soft robot that really just didn't take a lot of work compared to what we've seen previously. And so in terms of the functionality, one of the exciting things is that basically you can apply a, a basically a flat input of just constant fluid rate. And what we're end up seeing is that it's able to interpret that and have these oscillating motions. And again, uh, you probably can't, you won't, you can't really see it in the frames, but we all we have are just syringe pumps that are just basically moving at a con constant rate and it's able to interpret that. So we were really excited by these results, but there was something else that we were also interested in. And there was this big paper that came out from George Whiteside's group. And he talks about one of the limitations of quake type valves, which is a standard microfluidic valve. And he says that basically it's not straightforward to achieve a large pressure gain. So I'm gonna talk a little bit about what that means, but we set our sights on this pressure gain functionality. And so the idea here is basically that we're using another component. And this is a normally open fluidic transistor, transistor with the potential for pressure gain. And so we have that rigid casing, we have that compliant O-ring on top, we have uh, this rigid piston that connects these two compliant diaphragms. And so normally there should be flow moving from the source to the drain, but if you apply a gate pressure, it creates this type of force balance. And I'm simplifying this for the, the sake of this presentation, but it, essentially there's this force balance on this piston between the two. And it's gonna be related to the pressure times the area on both sides. And what you'll notice is we designed this top diaphragm with a smaller area than that of the bottom. And so what this enables is that even if the source pressure is much higher than the gate pressure, it's still able to close this and stop fluid from moving through. And this idea of a smaller input overcoming a larger input is referred to as gain. And so what we did was we designed a, a hand, if you will, a three-fingered hand, where basically we have different gain designs for each of these. And so the idea here is that basically we have a constant fluid that's being, or a constant pressure that's coming in from the top, and we have this gate pressure. And so when the gate pressure is off, nothing happens, none of the buttons are pressed. If you have a low pressure, that's only enough for that, that particular one with the largest diaphragm, the, the best gain behavior. So now if you were playing Mario, he would start moving to the right or direction. And then if you move to a medium pressure, now he starts running. And then finally, if you go to a high pressure, it's enough for all of the fingers to actuate and he's able to jump. And so this is showing the printing process for this one. It was about three to three and a half hours, but we're just you know under four hours, depending on how much you're printing. And then this is what it looks like after this port material has been removed. And obviously we add a little black light for fun. And so this is a video showing how it behaves. And so uh, in the blue highlighted region, you're gonna see live readings of what pressures are being uh, inputted into the hand. Again, there's gonna be a source pressure that's gonna be held constant or designed to be held constant. We're gonna have a gate pressure that's gonna go from off to low to medium to high, depending on what we want. Uh, and then you'll see that it's gonna cause the fingers to inflate, which have been glued to the, the components. We don't have any like lateral deflections. And then here you'll see what Mario does.
So not high scores, didn't play it very fast, but uh, it was able to beat the level. And um, that was through a computer, at least they wrote a computer program, plugged it in, press go, and then they stayed away from it and just watched. And so one thing that I'll highlight is um, for some reason, the journal does not like it if you reference your GitHub account. And they took this out of our supplementary material, the link to this. But uh, we do have all of the files from this work are available for free uh, from our GitHub you know, to download. You can get the different circuit elements, all the robots, everything that was in that work, you can download readily and use it. It is there. We refer to it in the journal paper. So it's really awkward that they removed it from our supplementary material without telling us, but it's there. Um, another question we often get is why uh, did you choose Super Mario as a demo? In fact, reviewers hated the Super Mario demo um, and we got rejected from Science Robotics, I'm pretty sure because of that. So I'm gonna show what the standard robot, robotic hand demo is. Normally it's, it's playing piano. All right, so this is an example of that. I don't love the, the example because there aren't really any, any critical penalties. If you, if you hit the wrong note, Nothing really happens. Like it might sound a little bit bad, but it's not a big deal. And you can also set the tempo arbitrarily. So you can play it incredibly slow, like in, in this paper that came out a little bit after our paper, um, or you can do it fast, but, but people typically don't, don't go for fast, they go for slower. Um, but basically what we wanted was uh, something that was a lot more challenging, where basically if you fail to press or depress a button at the right time, it's really easy to die in Mario. And certainly like my students were able to, to die many times. Uh, another one is that you don't get to make any changes. Everyone had, most people have seen or played Mario at some point in their life. You know what the level design looks like. You know how fast it needs to be beat. You know how the characters are moving. All of that, you don't get to, to kind of toy around with. And so as a result, I felt like this was a, a particularly challenging demo uh, for my students to do. And I, I felt like, they deserved a little bit more credit than, um, than, than some gave them because it was Mario and, and, and not a piano. But anyway, so in conclusion, we ended up demonstrating this, this fundamental concept to be able to print entire soft robotic systems with all the fluidic circuitry, completely assembled monolithically in a single print run. We demonstrated these continuously auto, actu, uh, oscillating actuations using a fluidic oscillator under constant fluid, fluid input conditions. And we also beat Super Mario Brothers, uh, just that first level, just by going from a low pressure to a medium pressure to a high pressure to off. And so with that, I'm gonna thank all of the uh, sponsors of the research in my group, and then I'll thank my students. And uh, I unfortunately have to go to a doctor's appointment. So if you have any questions, uh, please feel free to reach out to me uh, offline or by email or, or come stop by at some point. But thank you so much for having me here and uh, enjoy the rest of the symposium today.